Uh, so the final talk in the session is from Marilyn. The speaker is Matt Lentz, who is a fourth year PhD student. Um, and he's going to talk about drowsy power management. Hi, so I'm Matt Lentz. And this is joint work with James Linton, who's here in the audience today, as well as our advisor, Bobby Bhattacharji, all from the University of Maryland. So today, I'll be telling you about drowsy, which is both a system and a new power management state, which reduces energy consumption by targeting short-lived events. Now, these events occur in the background and consume energy when we're not even interacting with our devices. These short-lived events are typically application-generated. They last on the order of hundreds of milliseconds to a few seconds, and they are rather limited in scope. So, for example, you may just sample a sensor and perform some minor processing on this. Now, to really understand the problem that Drowsy solves, we have to understand the landscape and what is actually going on in the mobile devices today. So to that end, I'm going to present a real power trace that we collected from the Nexus 4 device running Android. So here we have power consumption on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is time in seconds. So we can see two large periods where there's peaks in this power consumption. And this corresponds to an event running. And in this case, we're pulling some data from a remote server over Wi-Fi. And at all other times, really there's limited power consumption, uh, far lower than the power consumed while actually running the event. Now, these two different states really correspond to the system switching between two power management states, on and suspend. So when the event is running, we're in the on state and actively processing the event. Now, once the event's handled, and every time that we're not handling event, the system remains in a suspended state, where basically the devices are placed in a low power state, CPUs are disabled, and uh, memory retains its contents. Now, the transitions between suspend and on are really these kind of wake-ups that occur, so we wake up to handle this event. Now, in the suspend trace, we can also see these small periodic peaks, and in this case, they're from the Wi-Fi controller, which is active in the background, connected to the AP, and it's really just uh, checking periodically for these queued uh, packets at the AP in power save mode. This is actually just the Wi-Fi controller waking up, not the whole system. So now, given this uh, trace, let's actually take a look at what's going on in the event itself. So here I'm going to zoom in. So the y-axis remained the same, while the x-axis is now measured in time in milliseconds. So what happens at the beginning of a wake-up event? Well, first of all, we have to have some interrupt. So this comes from a hardware device, in this case, the real-time clock, or RTC alarm, which generates this interrupt. Then the kernel begins this process of suspending, uh, of resuming the system from a suspended state into the on state. Now, once this is done, the system's ready to run the event that takes place. In this case, we're again just pulling data from a remote server over Wi-Fi. Now, after the event completes, ideally we want to transition back into a suspend state rather immediately in order to save power. So to do this, Android introduced a notion of wake locks. These are objects held by applications and device drivers, and while they're held, the system will remain in an on state. And then finally, when all of them are released, the system can transition safely back into suspend, knowing that the event was completely handled. So here we have that transition, where the kernel is essentially taking us from an on state, where everything's working and we can process the event, down into a suspended sleep state, where everything's low power. Now we can see here, highlighted by the colored areas, this really represents the energy that's happening here. So the power trace uh, is shown in the white line, and then this area is kind of the integral over the power, and we can see from this that the transitions are actually really inefficient compared to the event itself. So in this case, we consume 75% of the total energy consumption uh, while this event is being handled, and that goes towards transitions, whereas the event takes the remaining 25%. And so this is not only true for just the pull data event, but also for other events that we evaluate that are simply common uh, wake-up events that may occur while applications are um, running on the system. So what we want to do now is take a look at what's going on in these transitions to really identify the problem that we can solve with Drowsy. So we'll start by taking a look at the on to suspend transition. Now shown on the left is the steps that the kernel takes in order to transition from a working state down into this low power state. And on the right, we annotate the plot with the corresponding uh, time segments that are for these events. 
So first of all, I want to highlight these two. They're the largest, by a far margin, consumers of time and energy uh, during this transition. So the kernel, by freezing all tasks, is basically halting the execution of tasks and places them in what's known as a refrigerator, where they stay until the actual um, next transition back into the on state, which we'll take a look at in a second. In addition, the system suspends all devices, placing them in a low power state and quiescing any I.O. So now, let's take a look at the suspend on state, and we see a similar trend here. Resuming all devices and thawing all tasks takes up the vast majority of time and energy. And these observations really directly lead us into drowsy, where our key idea is that we should only wake up the tasks and devices that are necessary for what the event needs to do. So if we think back for a second for this uh, pool data wake up event, what is actually necessary? So first of all, we have the application, where of course it has to run, otherwise the event's not gonna do anything. We have some core system services that the application interacts with. We have the alarm device, which not only generated the wake up interrupt, but we use to actually set a future alarm in order to do this periodic event. And finally, the Wi-Fi device is used for communication. Now this is really what's necessary, but in actuality, there's a lot of unnecessary tasks and devices where this is only a small subset that are actually woken up that are completely unrelated to the event at hand, causing these transitions to be inefficient. So what Drowsy is really trying to do here is construct just the minimal wake set of tasks and devices. Now this minimal wake set can be defined as the smallest set of all tasks and devices that maintains correct system behavior as if all tasks and all devices were included in the wake set. And what Drowsy does is it takes this wake set and expands it on demand as the event progresses in order to operate in what the minimal wake set is at all times during the event. Now, we do have one constraint for both our design and implementation, and this is that we don't want to make any modifications to user space. So we want to be able to deploy Drowsy to all devices today and not require application developers to either specify what they use, if they even can do that, um, and potentially also you know, require modifications that would prevent them from taking advantage of the improvements by Drowsy just by default. So now, in order to take a look at what Drowsy does, let's take a look at the, let's first uh, take a look at what happens while transitioning from the suspend state to the drowsy state and back into suspend. So first of all, the steps remain similar, at least enabling the CPUs, but drowsy doesn't resume any devices by default. Uh, we'll grow this set over time. Now, we do thaw previously running tasks, where running really here is not just what you'll see from the output of a PS command, but it actually means it's either was on the CPU or on the run queue at the time of suspend. So this set contains at least one task, which is the task that was actually operating the suspend and resume transition for the kernel. Uh, there are usually just a handful of tasks that make up this set. So we can consider this the initial wake set that we construct at the end of this suspend to drowsy transition. Now while drowsy is operating, it grows this wake set over time, asking, uh, adding tasks and devices on demand based on monitoring the operations in the system, which I'll talk about in a second. Finally, once we have the event complete, the wake locks will all be released and the system can transition to suspend state. And so here we highlight the fact that we only need to freeze the tasks that were in the wake set, thus the ones that were previously thawed, and we only have to suspend the devices also in the wake set. So now let's take a look at exactly how Drowsy constructs this wake set on demand over time. So here, we're gonna take a look at a task running over time. So time here runs from the top to the bottom, and really this task represents a thread of execution. So we have three states that we'll expand upon as I go through this example. But first, the task is either running, meaning it's in this uh, thin white line state, and it's just running on the CPU, it's CPU bound. And then we have two enlarged portions that denote segments of time that it's performing I.O. So here the green segment is just saying it's running I.O. And purple denotes that it's actually running uh, I.O. that involves a device on the system. So we can see here that the task is performing uh, three I.O. operations over time. It's first opening a name piped, reading from the pipe, and then later it runs an ioctal command or sends an ioctal command to the device. Now, Tasks are not always running, so we also have this block state. So for instance, if the task was reading from the pipe, 
and there was no data in the pipe, then it would block waiting on this condition to be met. Namely, the number of bytes in the buffer has to be greater than zero. Now, this, will, this task will remain blocked until some other task comes by and satisfies this condition. So in this case, we have task B executing and then writing to the pipe later. Thus, it adds data into the buffer, and then task A's condition satisfied, can continue executing, complete that I.O. operation, and then continue on. Now, let's actually take a look from this example and rewind time and actually say that we have a suspended state here. This means that all wake locks were released at this point in time and we transitioned into a suspend state. So now when we're in a suspended state, all tasks and all devices in the system are either frozen or suspended. Um, and so we can see here, this is denoted by the blue segments uh, for the tasks. Now, later on, we'll transition back to drowsy as a result of a wake up interrupt. And at this point, the wake set is initially just the ta set of running uh, tasks on the system, which is just task B. It was previously running before you put, placed it in a frozen state during the suspend transition. Now, once task B runs, later on it will run the IO operation, uh, namely writing to the pipe, which will satisfy task A's condition. Now, drowsy keeps task A frozen, not operating on it, until we see that condition is satisfied, and then we add it to the wake set. Finally, task A will complete that I.O. and later interact with the device via the IOCTL command. And likewise, the devices remain suspended until we see that I.O. operation take place, in which case we both resume the device prior to driver code being executed, as well as add it into this wake set. So this is really how we build this over time. Now this is somewhat simplistic compared to actually what's going on in the real system. So we can take a look here at what will be the set of uh, kind of wake ups that look for the pull data event that I talked about earlier. So in this case, we explain the full, uh, full story of what's happening in our paper, but really the takeaway point is that we're actually waking up just 15 tasks and 16 devices, which are less than 2% of the tasks and devices that would otherwise be resumed um, or thawed as part of a transition to the on state. So really this is just the minimal set that needs to be woken up to handle this event. So now given the design of Drowsy, we implemented this within the Android kernel. So for hardware, we used the Google Nexus 4, which was uh, generated the power trace we saw earlier. And this roughly corresponded to around 4,600 lines of code that were either added or modified in the kernel. Now a challenge here is Android's a full-fledged kernel. It's based on Linux. And we really have to figure out exactly what to instrument in order to determine when to add tasks and devices into this wake set. So here we give a high level overview. Again, more details are in the paper. And of course, our source code is publicly available, so you can dig into that as well. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to be actually discussing just what we do to implement this file system or FS calls using the file operation structure. So for example, we may have, we may have tasks interacting with devices via this file operation call. So what the driver is doing is it's exposing um, functionality to tasks via the file abstraction. So tasks can open, read, and write files, and this driver here is tying functionality that it specifies to these open, read, and write uh, operations. Now, in Drowsy, we want to make sure that the actual device, the hardware device, is resumed prior to any of this code being run. Otherwise, the system could fall. So in this case, what we do is we simply wrap the kind of file operation that is occurring. So in this case, we'll take a look at what's happening for the write. So in this case, we substitute the function pointer of write with drowsy write, and we also add a new member variable, write impl, which stores the previous driver write. And now we can take a look at what drowsy write's really doing. Uh, so it takes the file as a parameter, and uh, it takes other parameters as well, depending on what the, what the write uh, system call provides. So in this case, we first start out by trying to identify what device is associated with, with the file. And in this case, it's usually tied to the major minor number information associated with the file. So once we have that device, we then need to check its state. So if it's suspended, then we should resume this device. Um, and in this process of resuming, you may resume other parental devices as well, based on this tree uh, in, maintained by the Linux kernel. So finally, then we're able to call the write impl function based on the file operations that we modified earlier. 
So now, given this, uh, given this implementation, let's take a look at how we evaluate Drowsy in order to gauge its benefits. So first, we want to take a look at what we do in the benchmarking application. So here we have uh, just a simple cycle, and it's really just wake-up events occurring over time. So we take the system from a suspend state to an on or drowsy state. We then have our application acquire wake clock, handle some I.O. event, which are specified below and shown earlier in the presentation, and then finally release the wake clock at the end. And then after the wake clock's released, the system can tr then uh, transition back into the suspend state uh, from either drowsy or on. So now, given this benchmarking application, we really need to uh, measure energy consumption. And this is the setup we use, uh, which also generated the power consumption plots that we saw earlier. So we have two digital multimeters, or DMMs, connected between the phone and the battery here to measure both the voltage as well as the current, where the current's measured across a precision shunt resistor where we use the V equals IR equation to recover the, uh, the phone's current. And plots of these, example plots, are shown on the right. Now these two DMMs are tied to a function generator in order to trigger them at the same time and retrieve coherent samples at the host. Now we have this power trace, but we also are interested in figuring out energy consumption for um, exactly what an application is doing for a limited amount of time, such as uh, suspending um, or the suspend transition or even a part of that just handling the tasks. So to do that, we need an externally measurable signal to synchronize what's happening in the software time with what's happening in the power trace. So to that end, we use a notification LED on the phone, affix a photoresistor on top of it, and tie that back to another digital multimeter. So in this case, we get something like this when the LED turns on. So we have a software timestamp, and we have an event in our power trace. So now we're able to figure out what the energy consumption is for each of these small uh, time periods that we're interested in. So now the first evaluation result I'll take a look at is the improvement in terms of the wake-up events uh, as a whole. So we have five different evaluation scenarios here uh, for each of the five different types of I.O. events that we, uh, we take a look at. So Android stock Android, and Drowsy is just our implementation on top of it. Android Plus contains some small optimizations that are slightly distinct from Drowsy, and so we evaluate them as a separate data point. Android Plus, one core in power save, and likewise for Drowsy, one core in power save, these correspond to, instead of using a user space governor, MP decision, which operates in the system to control the number of cores and their operating frequency, we actually just limit it to one core and power save to take a look at uh, how this works. We've seen in the past that MP decision um, makes poor decisions and ends up uh, potentially just changing the number of cores even though the work stays the same. So really the key thing here is that Drowsy is able to achieve 1.5 to 5x energy efficiency as compared to Android across these events. And really these benefits are usually commensurate in time except for the send case at the bottom. So this is kind of an interesting case that we can dive into a little bit. So here we see that the time speed up by drowsy is very minimal, um, yet the energy efficiency improvement is close to 2x. So why is that? It actually turns out that, uh, so we have this device driver on the system, CPU idle, and its goal is while we're in this on state, I want to be able to take the CPU down to idle states um, depending on some heuristics. And so this driver was able to actually enter deeper states more often in the drowsy state, and this is actually how we got this energy efficiency improvement. So now, what we're gonna do now is just take a look, go back to this kind of pull wake up plot, and see where this energy benefit looks in the actual power traces. So here, this is the familiar power trace where Android, uh, we have power consumption on the y-axis, time in milliseconds, and I'll mark the transitions and the time uh, and energy consumption for the event as well. Now, in Drowsy, we have what we see at the bottom. So we have this suspended Drowsy transition, which is small. Then we transition to this uh, handling the event. This time period also, because Drowsy wakes up uh, things as needed as the event progresses, this also takes into account what we're doing to expand the wake set. So for example, in this time and energy period, we'll actually wake up the Wi-Fi device. Later on, we'll have a suspend to drowsy transition. 
Now this extra tail here is from some Wi-Fi tail energy that's taking place that is otherwise embedded into the Android trace at the top, and we don't see it because the onto suspend transition just completely dwarfs it. But it's interesting to note that Drowsy is so fast that it actually exposes this in the power trace. So now we have, these, uh, we have this like, uh, improvement for the wake-up events. Now let's take a look at what happens in terms of battery life. So for each of the I.O. events, we vary the time between the events uh, from three seconds to five minutes. And this is on the x-axis in log scale. And on the y-axis, what we're doing is we're plotting the drowsy battery life improvement over Android or basically over the suspend on onto suspend transitions that would otherwise occur. So here we can see that what we would expect as the system uh, or as the interval between the events gets larger and approaches five minutes or infinity, we converge to 0% because drowsy is focused on improving these wake-ups. So if no wake-ups occur, we don't actually get any benefit. But we can see here a lot of, uh, you know, for sensors, you may actually get some amazing improvement, especially for context-aware apps, where you're interested in smaller uh, time intervals between checking these sensors. Um, and in addition, these are just for individual periodic tasks. In actuality, you have many different periodic tasks executing on the system, and so the benefits actually aggregate across all these applications that run. So Drowsy will uh, support all these numerous applications and provide you uh, greater energy efficiency. So in conclusion, existing power management is simply not optimized for these short-lived events that are application generated versus where, how we interact with uh, our computers in terms of just opening them up, interacting with them for a few minutes, and then closing them down. Here the transitions really matter. And so Drowsy, what we do is we wake up only the minimal set of tasks and devices in order to really just make these uh, events super efficient. And we are able to achieve 1.5 to 5x energy efficiency for these kind of short-lived tasks. And our source code that I mentioned earlier is publicly available at the following link. I encourage you to check it out. Um, and uh, I'll now take any questions that you have. Uh, hi, uh, Ardalan Amiri Sani, University of California, Irvine. Great work and great presentation, by the way. Uh, I was wondering if you increase the latency of handling these events. It seems like the wake-up time is shorter, but at the same time, the event handling is longer. So do you have any numbers, whether you affect that or not? Right, so I think what we can take a look at, just going back to this uh, trace that you're referring to, sorry about the animations, um, basically the latency in handling the event it's taking what you would have done during the suspend on period and actually just moving it during the event handling itself. So there's no overall latency um, kind of uh, increase unless you're, I guess, talking about what happens in the event. So if you have something that touches a device and then touches another device, that latency interval will increase. Um, I don't have any exact measurements on how that looks for different events, but as we can see here, it's usually very minimal. Um, and so, yeah, so that's your question? Yeah, yeah, no. thank you. Hi, uh, Markus Hainel, Theo Dresden. Um, your benchmarks mainly detail how much you save within the single event, right? Um, do you have any insights on what this means for my battery life for the phone as a whole, so like my day-to-day -day operation? Right, so I think what's interesting is, uh, I, and I definitely want to take a look at this as part of future work, if we could actually deploy this in order, uh, in terms of like adding into the Android operating system and having Google provide this to end users, it would be kind of interesting to take a look at the uh, different uh, groups of users, different demographics, and how the energy improves. But for now, it's hard to really define a common set of applications, a common set of tasks, that uh, would fit across these demographics. I think they're widely separated, but it's definitely something I'm interested in looking at. Thank you. Uh, Hi, Bo Chen from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Um, I think it's a very nice observation and a very good solution. So um, could you comment a little bit on the security impact uh, of uh, Drossy uh, power management? Because uh, the, uh, could it be some like, side chain information uh, for example, if there are one uh, malicious applications running in the background, or maybe uh, just run co-running with other applications, it can leverage the uh, number of devices um, 
which are um, powered on mm -hmm. to see which applications are currently running so that it can uh, monitor some like phishing attacks or you are hijacking. Right, so if I understand your question correctly, it's that uh, if you're monitoring the length of the wake-ups, then this malicious application could potentially determine what's going on in the system, is that correct? Yeah. Um, right. And yeah, that's definitely true. I think that um, this was actually kind of interesting and related to a talk presented using security where uh, a team of researchers actually took a look at the battery uh, power consumption over time and were able to derive location from it. And so definitely the kind of uh, energy consumption and things you do in there can be used in order to kind of derive this potentially sensitive information. And I think one of the things that we need to look at is how to actually hide this from the applications potentially. Um, or just simply consider adding permissions to say, hey, this actually, by releasing this information or by being able to time these kind of how long these wake-ups are occurring, this, uh, this application may be able to also uh, discover this information about you. So. Okay. Mohammed Kadib, GSTA Research. Uh, nice work, thank you. Uh, right on this slide, if you take a look at the uh, y-axis, you get the power, you see you are almost uh, due to drowsy, you are having the power consumption, right. the, the surge current. Yeah. Have you measured any impact on increasing in lifetime of the battery? I mean, in two ways. I, first is increasing before you recharge again, and the lifetime in terms of cycles. So the battery lifetime uh, is mostly for this plot here. So when we take a look at the kind of intervals, then we can take a look at for an individual periodic task, what this, uh, what this provides in benefit. Uh, a question earlier was asking if we had uh, a better idea about uh, workloads, and uh, currently we don't, but again, we're interested in looking at that. Right, the sa what I'm trying to say, the saving is not just in time, because you reduce the surge current, actually uh, your discharge current will go farther. I see and thus increase mean. the lifetime of the battery even for the same amount of time. I, I see what you mean now. Yeah, that's... So that uh, could be something cool. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Russ Bland from Apple. Um, have you... You said user space changes were off limits. Um, have you thought about what uh, further gains you might get by, say, coalescing tasks that are part of the wake set together if the, the task suspend and resume is really dominating the uh, processing time here? Right, I, I think one key thing is that, uh, so if we're waking up, for example, uh, we've seen that the SD card device is actually a particularly heavy consumer in terms of the transition costs. So if you have that device woken up for some various reason, an application chose to, to write back to the SD card, you should actually be able to kind of uh, loosely specify this at the application layer of, oh, these other applications want to also write to the SD card, but they're willing to back their contents up in memory for a little time. And so I think coalescing at the level of what devices are on and kind of having an idea of minimum and maximum times between uh, kind of events of writing back to the SD card, for example, that would definitely be uh, an improvement for energy efficiency. And so in Drowsy, we can detect exactly what's being used and take advantage of that information. Hi, um, Jen Lee, Huawei Technologies. Um, first of all, great work. Um, I understand your work mainly target short-lived tasks, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, if I understand correctly, um, actually, oftentimes, long-lasting tasks like videos can be the battery killers for mobile devices. So that said, can you comment on, based on your experience, how to cope with, uh, combine your technology with uh, other existing power management technologies to increase the battery life for long, task, uh, long tasks? And if so, like how much you would expect? So I, I think the kind of uh, key thing is that we will improve energy efficiency for long-lived tasks, but the relative gains are smaller simply because the device is staying on, you're interacting with it, and the transition benefit is limited. Also, when interacting with the device more fully, you're waking up more tasks and devices. And so really this minimal set is perfectly suited towards the short-lived tasks. So I don't really have any good numbers on exactly how we improve for long-lived tasks, um, but it's possible that uh, with some of the coalescing stuff I had mentioned here, that when you're active in the long-lived tasks, then you may figure out other things to do during that time as well that, uh, that otherwise would just be uh, wasting energy, so. Thank you. Yeah.